from the bright lights of the Windy City, over the plains of North Dakota, and through the peaks of the Cascade Mountains, Amtrak's Empire Builder gets passengers to 45 destinations every single day. When you're out here in the wild country along this route, you're going to need a locomotive that won't let you down. This route cuts through some of the steepest terrain in the world, and huge challenges call for the most powerful locomotives. Let's check out the twin monsters that are going to be pulling us on our journey. The Empire Builder is pulled by two of these beasts right here. This is a 4,250 horsepower GE Genesis locomotive. These locomotives, they're just like big bullets. That's all part of their monocoque design. In a monocoque design, the entire locomotive shell is one composite piece. It's super light, so the train can go faster. Monocoque, it's French, it's a single shell. The old locomotive that the Genesis replaced weighed 130 tons. The Genesis weighs in at a lean and mean 121 tons. That's 18,000 pounds lighter than the old locomotive. You can see by the shape of this locomotive how aerodynamic it is. It's like a jet plane almost. I think it's smiling at us, Kenny. I think so too. Speed and power are what make the Empire Builder the top of the line. It's over 2 million pounds of train whipping through 2,200 miles of plains and mountains in under two days' time. The slightest problem with the wheels or the brakes could result in derailment. To make sure our train is ready to tackle this route, we've got to get underneath it over at the Union Station Locomotive Shop. Today's Empire Builder has just arrived in Chicago Yard from Seattle. But before it goes anywhere, it's going to need to get a check up here at the Chicago Maintenance Facility. Let's get to work. It's 4 p.m. right now, and tomorrow's Empire Builder leaves in less than 24 hours. This crew will be getting the train ready up till the very last minute. I'm going to put on this white suit because it's going to get really, really dirty under there, man. <laughs> we always like wedgies. Which is it? Just don't go away. This train is 12 cars long and weighs over 1,000 tons. Believe me, no one wants to be down here. But these inspectors have the most important job in the yard, making sure our train stays on the tracks. This set's going back out in a few hours, and nobody wants a bad car going out on the rails. These Empire Builder trains run through the highest elevations in the country, and that means rain, snow, wind, you name it. So we're looking for worn brakes, cracked wheels, and any other defects that could spell trouble. Wheels are the most important part of the train. Especially on passenger trains, you need a smooth ride. That's why Eddie here is checking every single one. This is the actual, one of the brakes in the passenger car, looking for cracks. Eddie has to inspect each of the train's wheels to make sure that they're not worn out or damaged. And he has to be careful. Other members of the crew are running checks on brakes while we're down here. If Eddie puts his fingers in the wrong place, they are not coming out. So just another danger under here for Eddie. That's 110 pounds right there, and crushing your fingers. And in here. Yep, both sets. And if Eddie here finds something really wrong that just can't be fixed right here on the inspection track, the car's taken out, they'll take a new car from the yard and put it in. Keeping the passengers safe, we're not dealing with freight cars here. We're dealing with people that are riding trains, probably the most important cargo in the world. Not a problem, it is, it's people. Passenger trains have been moving people across America for over 200 years. During World War II, ridership on trains like the Empire Builder soared. One-way tickets from Chicago to Seattle topped out at $75, which would equal almost $900 today. Taking a ride on the Empire Builder was the thing to do. The maintenance crew was up all night making sure our Empire Builder train is safe and ready to go. Now we're going to make it more passenger friendly. It's 9 a.m. and the crew of the Empire Builder just showed up to start working the train. Amtrak's Empire Builder is America's most popular overnight train, known for its on-time service. That means we'd better get going. For the Empire Builder, this is one-stop shopping. Every day, they do over a ton of food, 65 gallons of liquor, and a thousand lemons. It all starts here. Next, our train is loaded with everything that will be needed for the cross-country journey. If we don't pick it up here, 
There are going to be a lot of hungry and unhappy passengers on the train. We certainly don't want that. Now, we've got to get each of the passenger cars cleaned and ready to go. Behind the two Genesis locomotives on the Empire Builder, one baggage coach and ten Superliner cars. And they all need cleaning. Be sure to close your windows when you're going through the train wash. The crew has four hours to get each car spick and span and ready for passengers. This place is like a hotel built for the rails. And there we go, fluff it up. Over a thousand linens have to be put on the train before it departs. We're cleaning windows. We're flushing toilets. Vacuuming floors. The crew has to make beds. Come to Sort the silverware. And stock the supplies. The ice cream. Desserts, my favorite, turkey burgers. Flat iron steak, shrimps, you got bananas, you got juice ball, frozen chickens, frozen vegetables. They've got 350 eggs, over a thousand cups, and 200 tomatoes. There's a lot of people on this train and they're hungry. After four hours of primping and prepping, the Empire Builder is ready to be brought into Union Station to meet its passengers. In the next hour and a half, four transcontinental trains will be leaving this station, but ours is the grandest of them all, the Empire Builder. The man the Empire Builder is named after, James J. Hill, called this rail line his great adventure. Well, my adventure along Hill's route is just moments away, but before we can go anywhere, we've got to get 400 people and their luggage on board. This is Chicago's Union Station, the starting point for America's premier overnight train, the Empire Builder. The 2.15 p.m. Empire Builder is leaving for Seattle in less than an hour. But before we go, we first have to get all the passengers' bags on board. The Amtrak employees here at Union Station have to work in unison. This assembly line is the only way to keep the trains moving. One wrong move could send a bag, or even worse, a person to the wrong destination. So Amtrak has created a system to make sure the right bags get to the right place. This is the ticket office. This is where you check your bag if you don't need it during the trip. Hey, how you doing, Tom? Thanks, sir. How many bags? I just have one today. Take good care of that now. Thank you, sir. I know you will. The challenge is sorting out hundreds of bags quickly and efficiently. Spread. The bags just keep right on coming. How many bags do you think we're going to be putting on the Empire Builder today? Uh, about two or three hundred. Two or three hundred bags. And with the last bags coming in 15 minutes before departure, there's no time to rest. This is people's personal stuff. You want to really take care of it. You got to be gentle with it. You don't want to slam it around too Absolutely much. Absolutely right. So I'm going to put my bag on. Let's we'll see if this gets to Seattle. I have a good feeling it will. Once the cart is full, the baggage crew takes it out to the train. All right, the last bags are in. We've got less than 10 minutes before we depart. You can see there's no messing around down here. These guys move fast. The train is fully loaded today. We've got hundreds of people in here waiting to get on. May I have your attention, please? This is a general boarding announcement for train 7, 27807, the Empire Builder. Boarding now in the North Boarding Lounge through Gate B, Track 19. The Empire Builder is known for its on-time service. The train's just minutes from departure, and there's still passengers that haven't boarded the train. Even a minute's delay on our train can have a domino effect on any of the other train schedules. All the passengers are on board. Now we just got to tell the dispatch center we're standing by. The Chicago Control Center dispatches over 300 trains every single day. So when they're ready for us, we had better be ready for them. You just punch the button to tell the Control Center we're ready to go. These passenger trains run on a tight schedule, and any delay here at Chicago is going to mess us up along the trip. There's still passengers getting on board. This passenger doesn't know where to go. OK, here we go. All right. 
Are we all set? We've got everybody on board? We're all set. Everybody's ready and we're ready to go. Can I say all, all aboard? Absolutely you can. Okay. Get, get on. Do get you on. need an official hat to do that? Oh yeah, excellent. Look at this. All right. All aboard! Over 400 passengers and 2,500 pounds of baggage are on board and ready to go. It's 2.15. We're on schedule. On any passenger train, safety is paramount. So Amtrak goes above and beyond to ensure a smooth and safe journey. I'm riding the locomotive of Amtrak's Empire Builder. Each locomotive has a throttle to control speed, a horn to alert other trains and motorists, and a direct line of communication with dispatch. When it comes to safety, Amtrak doesn't take any chances. This locomotive has an emergency safety feature built in to make sure that the engineer is in control. Safe operation of the train and sticking to the schedule is always on the engineer's mind. The federal government mandates that engineers only work 12 hours, but that isn't the only safeguard in place to make sure these guys don't fall asleep at the controls. Every 30 seconds, the engineer must touch the controls to confirm that he's still at the helm. The alerter makes sure that he's doing something over here. He's got about 30 seconds. If he doesn't blow the horn or touch the throttle, touch the brakes, the alerter starts going off. It starts counting down 30, 29, 28, and so on. Until it gets down to zero, that means that he hasn't done anything. The train's going to make an emergency application to the brakes and stop. A lot of times, Bill will be riding over here and he doesn't touch anything because we're just going along 79 miles an hour. He has, doesn't have to do anything. He has that button over there that he can hit to shut the alerter off. So he just has to hit it, just like that. And the locomotive knows that Bill here is still alive and still awake. But the safety precautions don't stop there. Amtrak restricts top speeds on all of its locomotives so they can't go too fast. Now, Bill. I know this Genesis locomotive can go 110 miles an hour, but you can't do that out here, can you? No, 79 is the maximum authorized speed with the overspeed set at 83. The overspeed function sets a ceiling for how fast our train can go. Like the alerted button, it provides added safety to the crew and passengers. We're going 79 miles an hour right now. Now Bill is going to get this train up over that. We'll see the overspeed function work. We'll show you how safe this is. We're up to 80. We're up to 80. There you are, Mr. Hear the beeping? That's telling him he's going too fast. If he doesn't respond, then the train's going to come to a stop, and he's going to have to answer to somebody. Throwing a train into emergency would be like slamming on the brakes of your car. But instead of skidding out, a train can derail. So Amtrak trains its engineers to use these safety controls only as a last resort. We're now about 100 miles outside of Chicago. It's mid-afternoon, and that means it's lunchtime. In the 46 hours between Chicago and Seattle, there are five meal times and 400 miles to feed. The toughest job on the train is keeping all these people happy. The Empire Builders dining car has two levels. The upstairs level can seat up to 65 diners at a time. The bi-level dining car is a restaurant on the rails. Preparing and serving food on a moving train isn't easy, but for the workers on the Empire Builder, they can't let the passengers know that. The real work is happening down on the lower level in the full-service kitchen. There, in-house chefs make everything from Caesar salad to omelets, all while the train is racing along at 79 miles per hour. The order goes down this chute right here to the kitchen in the lower level. When the clip comes down, that means people are hungry upstairs. See what we have here. Order up. 200 eggs this morning alone.
drama, sir. Oh, thank you. It's nice and hot. Oh, this looks delicious. Amtrak even offers a wine tasting session to pass the time. This is tough. The people are barking orders at you. The train's moving. This is crazy. Today's Empire Builder is known for its smooth ride and scenic views. Most passengers know nothing of this route's amazing history. In the 1890s, business tycoon James J. Hill wanted to expand his burgeoning empire through trade with Asia. But to do it, he needed to connect his businesses in the Midwest to the port of Seattle. The route was too brutal and too costly for horse-drawn carriages. So Hill came up with a bold and brilliant plan, the Great Northern Railway. James Hill, the man who forged the route of the Empire Builder, wasn't about to let anything get in his way, not even the Rocky Mountains. The laying of the rails cost thousands of lives. But finally, on January 6, 1893, Construction on the Great Northern Railway's line to Seattle was complete. Because of his ruthless determination, Hill became known as the Empire Builder. And it was his legacy that gives our train its name. Today, Amtrak's Empire Builder operates on much of the original Great Northern Rail Line. For some small towns, this Empire Builder train is still the transport link connecting them to the rest of the country. On some parts of the route, there are no interstates for over 200 miles. There is a constant coming and going of passengers at each of the 45 stops. We're about 150 miles west of Chicago, about to make a stop in Columbus, Wisconsin. Hey there, man. Would you like a pillow? This is Rolando. It's his job to take care of the passengers and make sure they get on and off the trains safely and efficiently. Oh, we're just going to go downstairs and the bridge open the door. All right, let's go downstairs. super line of cars two levels so we just went down from the upper level downstairs we've got a schedule to keep to passengers must depart from the lower level so Rolando has to keep everybody moving it's quick stop we've done detraining for the baggage get them in get off get them in oh nice well, ladies and gentlemen our next stop here in a couple of minutes of 10 to 12 minutes will be up Columbus all right one second man hold on we can't get off yet Hey, watch your steps, please. Okay, everybody's off. Now we've got just three minutes to get the rest of these people on. As you can see, there's a lot of people waiting to get on this train. Watch your step, ma'am. Do you need assistance? Three minutes? Are you smoking? We don't even have time to have a smoke. we got to get back on this train. we got to get to Seattle. Here I go. Let's get going. We get out of there right on time. And it's a good thing we did because we're heading into the largest and wildest mountain chain in America. And we want to get there before the sun goes down. Right now I'm riding the premier overnight train in America, baby. I'm on the Empire Builder. After 22 hours, the Empire Builder is halfway between Chicago and Seattle, my final destination. We've traveled over 900 miles from Illinois to Wisconsin to Minnesota, and now we're in North Dakota. And the halfway point means we've got to recharge and mine at North Dakota before heading into the mountains. There's a lot to be done. They have to refresh the potable water. They have to do an inspection of the train. They have to take out the trash. Potable water is used for bathing, cooking, and drinking on the train. And on a passenger train like this one, running out is not an option. We've been almost 1,000 miles, so most of the water's been used up. This is where they put more water in. Can I get this for you, this water hose? Yeah. All right, we're going to refresh the potable water in the train. Got to clean it off. Where's it go? Right in there? Okay. Clean it off because this is drinking water too. So then we're gonna put it right in there. This thing's gonna fill up until it overflows and it'll know it's full. 
On a train like this, I guarantee it's empty. A lot of people, gone a long ways. This is a very important stop for this train. We're done filling up our water tanks. It's time to get back on our journey. The water on the Empire Builder is mostly used for drinking and bathing. But back when steam trains ran along this line, water played a crucial role in keeping the locomotives running. In a coal-fired steam train, energy is produced by burning coal to heat water, turning the water into steam. But once the coal was burned, train crews had to get rid of the burnt ash. Keeping a steam locomotive running was a filthy job. One thing they had to do after every trip was empty the burnt ashes from the coal up here above. The ash from the burnt coal sits on a bed of grates until the crew is ready to dispose of it. They've never seen this, so uh, explain it to me. All right, as soon as the fireman's gonna dump the ash, you'll see the ash come down. We're gonna flood the entire pan with water. That'll put out all the ashes so we don't have to worry about burning the ties that are underneath the locomotive. I guess it's kind of like dumping out the barbecue pit after you had a big roast, except it's the size of a double bed. Absolutely, the ash pan is huge. So what would happen if you just let this go and didn't do it, let the ash build up? Well, if the ash built up inside the ash pan, it would eventually reach the height of the grate and the heat from the fire would actually melt the grates, which you, are made of cast iron. Anybody ever done that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and if there's no grate, there's nothing to keep the fire and the heat contained in the firebox or coal stove. The heat wouldn't be concentrated enough to boil the water and the locomotive wouldn't run. All right, Bruce, it looks like we're about ready to go. Okay, ready, set, dump them. The ash in that pan is 2,000 degrees. So this is where the water comes in. You're looking at something right now that you're just inches from it, and it's 2,000 degrees. The water breaks down the ash into smaller pieces while also cooling it down. We're going to use the injector, which normally puts water in the boiler. We're going to divert the water so that it actually fills the ash pan and cools off the burnt coal. <laughs> The heat from the ash means a constant threat of getting burnt. Ow! Hot! That's some nasty looking water! The crew then I has to carefully out. dispose of the lava-like ash. It's no longer 2,000 degrees, but it still feels pretty hot to me. Wow, it's hot! Looks like some kind of bubbling hot swamp from the prehistoric area. You yeah, haven't, yeah. haven't seen anything yet. Once the ash can is cleared out, a new fire is lit and the steam engine can get up and running again. That's a beautiful night. Nothing like getting a couple of bugs in the teeth sticking your head out the window. Watching the countryside roll by. We've just gone through North Dakota and are nearing the base of the Rocky Mountains. This is one of the wildest places in the entire country. We've basically gone from like the easiest conditions in Montana, just flat out running, to uh, like in five minutes we're up here in the mountains and gone to the most difficult conditions. In the 1870s, crossing the Rockies by train seemed impossible. Elevations ran up to 10,000 feet. No railroad would dare run tracks up that high. In fact, James J. Hill's plans to build through these huge mountains were known as Hill's Folly. Undaunted, he scoured the Rockies for a way through. On December 11, 1889, Hill's surveyors found the answer, Mariah's Pass. 100 miles long and six miles wide, it is less than half the height of the surrounding peaks. James J. Hill found the perfect crossing for his train right here at Mariah's Pass. Within months, Hill's path through the Rockies was complete. 
The route over Marias Pass led to an even bigger discovery. The pass sits on the southern edge of what is now known as Glacier National Park, a 1,500 square mile wilderness with over 700 lakes, 1,000 species of plants, and hundreds of types of animals. The Great Northern Railway introduced America's Switzerland to the world. The landscape is so beautiful that the schedule of the Empire Builder is specifically timed to go through the park during daylight hours. Today is a smooth and safe ride over the Rocky Mountains. We are now through Glacier National Park. Wow, holy cow. And passengers are getting ready to get some rest. The lucky passengers on the Empire Builder, they'll be traveling in style tonight on the sleeper car. In a sleeper car, the upper level has five bedrooms, which can hold 10 people, nine roomettes holding 18 people, one crew room, and a shared bathroom. The lower level has one family bedroom, four roomettes, a shower, and a room for luggage. And this is Doris. And if there was a superhero of hospitality, she's the one right here. Empire Builder passengers receive around-the-clock attention, and Doris is just getting started. OK. There I go. What was that? That was the call bell for the sleepers. All now right. it's time to put down one of the beds. So that's uh, it's time for Doris to go into action. No rest for the weary. Every car has its own dedicated attendant like Doris, who makes sure that each bed is turned down whenever each passenger is ready. You're not getting a lot of sleep on this train. Not much. Which way do you want your head to go? Up here, please. All right, so which way am I going to turn it? Just like set this? It down. Perfect. Like this? Yep, and then just unroll it. Unroll it. Yep, now push it up against the Ow. back, <laughs> and then it'll fold out. Okay, so I'm folding it out this way? Perfect. Oh, you're good. Now fold it down like a pie. All right, so it looks very inviting for them. Okay. Flip it up. All right, that's how I roll, two pillows. Now I'm going to try to put this up without pinching myself. Use the handle. Use there the, you oh, go. wow, look at that. Pumps right up. Nice. There you go. And before we've even nice. got our first bed made, another passenger is ready for Doris. And I can look up above and see this light here where it's lit. So it's number five right here. This one, and I get some old There goes another in. attendant call button. Yes. Oh, you must really have your work cut out for you. How long does it take to do this around bedtime? Um, everybody is individual, so I wait until they call me so that they can go to sleep when they choose. So you could be up till 3 in the morning? Absolutely. With the prices people pay, they expect to be taken care of. Another bed made, another bell, all night long. It's going to be a long night for Doris and I, but an even bigger day tomorrow. The Rockies are a cakewalk compared to the kind of conditions we'll see in the most extreme mountain range in the U.S., the Empire Builder's biggest challenge. I'm heading west on the Empire Builder, and it's a beautiful day in America. The crew and I have been up all night making sure Empire Builder passengers get a good night's sleep as we pass through the Rocky Mountains. Passengers on the Empire Builder may have had a good night's sleep, but for the workers, there's no rest. We've made it through the Rockies and have now entered the Cascade Mountains. This mountain range runs 700 miles from Canada to Northern California, with peaks up to 14,000 feet. It's amazing they ever built a railroad up here. Getting a train through the Cascade Mountains was James J. Hill's greatest challenge. The route cuts through the most remote wilderness in the country. There was no low-lying pass cutting through to Seattle so Hill had to tackle the mountain another way. It took three different attempts and cost hundreds of lives before they found a path to the other side of these mountains. We're 3,700 feet above sea level. They used to run the trains right here. Now it's just black bears, cougars, and Bigfoot. Trains couldn't get up and over the Cascade steep inclines. So Hill had a brilliant idea using a newly developed railroading technique. The original route was so steep, James Hill had to cross it on switchbacks. Switchback tracks made climbing the steep grades of the Cascades possible. They did it by reducing them into more manageable and gradual inclines. The train ascends along a first set of tracks, past a junction or switch, 
before going headlong into a dead-end track. A thrown switch directs the train up a more elevated set of tracks. The train zigzags up the mountain, thereby conquering the steep grades. The train would come through here, and then it would pull into a dead-end track down there. It was like this. Pull into the dead-end track, there's a switch right here. So the whole train would pull in, then back up through the switch, and change its elevation. Simple as that. But the switchbacks lengthened the route, which meant the railroad had even more track to clear every time it snowed. The results weren't pretty. During construction, this place was nicknamed Death Mountain. With snow falling in feet rather than inches, tracks were often covered as soon as they were laid. The builders had to find a way to keep the path clear as they laid the new rail. A hundred years ago, the only way to keep the tracks clear of snow was by hand. Right below me is some of the original roadbed from the 1800s. I'm from Maine, so I know about shoveling the white stuff, but clearing off tracks with more than seven feet of snow on them, I want to see what that's like. After a big storm, tracks were often buried, and waiting for the snow to melt was not an option. Back in Hell's Day, life was cheap, and all that mattered was running the trains. So, so I get down further into the snow, it's like so compacted, it's like ice. I might have bitten off more than I can chew. This snow is packed tight. The road bed underneath me hasn't seen daylight for months. Would have been 100 men doing this 100 years ago in one spot, just clearing the snow, just having at it. Get the snow out of the way. Hill knew it was all about manpower and didn't care how he got the job done. He bragged that given enough workers and whiskey, he could build a railroad to hell. And you know what? I think I'm halfway there. Shoveling out a hole like this ah, would be like arm wrestling a grizzly bear. Now I can see why they used hundreds of men. This is seeming more and more hopeless. You know what? I'm down about six feet, and this is about all I can take. If it was 100 years ago, James J. Hill would have sent me to the bread line and got a warm body in here to finish my job. Thankfully today, men don't have to do this. They have giant machines that move the snow off the tracks to keep the trains moving. Today, railroads use snow plows like the Jordan Spreader, which can move up to 10 feet of snow at a time. That's handy, given that the Cascades see up to 200 inches of snow each year. All year round, work crews maintain these tracks to keep the trains running. But in the late 1800s, snow plows were not an option and keeping the tracks clear and trains running proved nearly impossible. So Great Northern came up with a second solution, a tunnel. Hill's original tunnel is no longer in use, so to get there, I'm gonna need the help of some new technology. The original Cascade Tunnel was built over 3,300 feet above sea level. The slopes around it are plagued by avalanches, so only the few dare to make this trek. This is where the tracks of the old tunnel used to be, right here. I can't believe they used to run trains up here. This was railroad at its toughest, man. The tunnel was 2.6 miles long, and by cutting through the mountain, it cut out 12 of the steepest miles of switchback track. After the switchbacks, this was the easy way. This is the eastern portal of the old Cascade Tunnel. Wow, look at that thing. The original Cascade Tunnel is a feat of early 20th century engineering. But the builders forgot to consult the real keeper of the Cascades, Mother Nature. The result was the tunnel that should have never been built. In February 1910, two trains were stranded just west of the tunnel in Wellington, Washington. For six days, a blizzard pounded the mountain. Shortly after midnight on March 1st, a lightning storm lit up the sky. A rumble shook the mountain. And within seconds, an avalanche of snow, trees, and rocks came crashing down the mountain, wiping both trains off the tracks. They eventually came to a halt 1,000 feet down into the canyon below. 96 people died in the Wellington disaster. 
it is still the most lethal avalanche in the history of the United States. The Wellington disaster proved that the current tunnel was still not the answer to getting safely over the Cascade Mountains. So the Great Northern Railway tried a third and final option, another brave engineering gamble. On the other side of these mountains is Puget Sound in Seattle, but to get there, we have to go through the longest tunnel in the United States. I've jumped off Amtrak's Empire Builder and am now standing in the snowiest place in America, the Cascade Mountains. I'm standing here at the portal of the longest tunnel in the United States. It's the only direct route for trains from the east coming into Seattle. In 1926, 16 years after the Wellington disaster, the Great Northern Railway started building a new eight mile long Cascade Tunnel. The new tunnel's location was 500 feet lower than the old one. When they started the project, building an eight mile tunnel in three years was thought to be impossible. It took 1,700 workers and nearly 5 million pounds of dynamite to blast the way through the mountain. But they did it, and in just three years, the tunnel was completed on schedule. The tunnel itself is 20 feet 10 inches high and 16 feet wide. There's only one single track through the tunnel, so east and westbound trains take turns going through it. Today, the hardest job is keeping the 90-year-old tunnel in operation. In a tunnel this long, airflow is a major concern. If the air wasn't cleaned out, the exhaust would be toxic to the people on the trains and the engines would stall. Trains emit potentially toxic fumes in small increments. Outside, these emissions are negligible. But in an eight mile long tunnel with no airflow, these fumes can stagnate. So these giant fans pump the fumes out of the tunnel. When the tunnel door is closed, these giant fans blow cool air in, sending oxygen to the locomotives. Each fan blows enough oxygen into the tunnel to keep the airflow constant. This right here is the generator that powers the fans in the tunnel. The fans blow the clean air into the tunnel at 35 miles per hour. Right here, this is the fan tube. This is where the air comes out, blows the diesel fuel out of the tunnel. But air is not the only thing that maintenance crews need to keep flowing. They need to keep water from melting snow or heavy rainfall out of the tunnel. When you're in a 7.8 mile long tunnel with a huge mountain over you with snow melting, it's going to be a constant battle. They're going to be springing leaks. If water collects in the tunnel, there's trouble. The water from the drainage pipe is supposed to come out right here. As you can see, it's not flowing, so we got to get it going again. Let's get to work. These guys are fixing major problems before they happen. This is ballast right here, all these rocks. What it's used for is to hold the track in place, gives the track grip so it doesn't go anywhere, and it's also used for drainage. The water just falls down in between the rocks, and if everything's set right, it runs away from the tracks. The drainage pipe in this tunnel isn't working. If it was working, the water dripping down from the ceiling would filter through the ballast and out to the sides of the tunnel. There, the water would enter the open drainage pipes. These pipes are set on an incline so that the water will flow from the middle of the tunnel out. But this pipe is sagging. That means it's no longer on an incline and the water is just sitting stagnant in the pipe, not draining. If they didn't fix this pipe, eventually you'd almost have like a lake in here, giant mud puddle. The tracks are gonna get muddy. The ballast is not gonna serve its purpose. The tracks will sink and you're gonna have a derailment. We need to find the bad section of the pipe and lift it so we can get the water flowing again. These guys have to think on their toes to get the job done. They've only got a little bit of a window, and then the next train's gonna come through. First, we have to get the shovels out and dig to find the bad section of pipe. And we have to be quick. There's a train scheduled to come through here in 45 minutes. Even in today's modern world of railroading, it's still pure manpower that keeps these tracks in the tunnel in good working order. It's time to do some shoveling. 
get right down in there and dig it out. They're gonna move. It's a good thing the airflow in this tunnel is taken care of. I'm gonna need all the oxygen I can get. It's tight quarters. I'm rubbing up against this tunnel wall. It's covered in carbon and oil and grease. It's a good workout any way you look at it. All right, we've uncovered the piece of problematic pipe. Now the fun begins. Here comes the abrasion saw. What they're gonna do is they're gonna cut the pipe right about here. And, oh, I can hear the chainsaw. <laughs> now that the bad section of pipe is gone, we're going to dig out the remaining ballast to create the ditch that will drain the water out of the tunnel, making it safe for trains to travel again. 365 days a year inside this tunnel, we've got water coming down. These guys are fighting it every day. The water's really running now. Look at that. We fixed the pipe. Now the water's running just like it should and we can run trains safely through here again. We just passed through the longest tunnel in America, and that was a smooth ride. A clear cascade tunnel means we've made it through the Empire Builder's most difficult obstacle. Get your umbrellas out. Next stop, the Emerald City. Seattle, here I come. When I get there, I'm not coming back because I'm joining a grunge band. Before this route existed, efficient American trade with Asia was merely a pipe dream. But once James J. Hill set his mind to connecting the Pacific Northwest with the rest of America, the dream became reality. In the 1870s, Seattle had a population of 1,100. By the 1920s, it had exploded to 315,000 and trade with Asia turned Seattle into the metropolis it is today. All of this happened because the Great Northern Railway and the Empire Builder crossed mountains where nobody else dared to go. 